Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to our panel on international um, cycling cities. Um, so I'll be presenting first. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Caroline Johnson. I work for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And um, I'm going to talk to you about our campaign on cycling cities. It's an international campaign. Um, and it's to, the goal is to bring 25 million more people near safe cycle lanes by 2025. Um, so one of the things that I really love about this campaign and one of the things we were kind of playing around in terms of um, a title, an alternative title for this panel as well, is that the cities that we're working with primarily on our campaign are um, majority throughout the global south. Um, so in Latin America and Africa and Asia. And we were kind of, you know, one of the things I like about it is thinking about um, international cities um, beyond Copenhagen and Amsterdam, right? They're, they're, those are often some of the only ones that are sort of touted as success stories. Not that they're do, not doing amazing things, but there's also really amazing things happening all around the world. And um, one of the things that our campaign is doing is kind of broadening the pie of different voices uh, for international cycling cities and, and really showing off some of the amazing and creative um, work that cities are doing all around the world. Um, I'm also here to talk a little bit about our work in LA, but um, Eli Kaufman from the LA CBC, who's a partner with us, is also gonna be talking about our work in LA. LA is the only city in the US that's part of this campaign. And um, as many, if you have spent time in LA, or if you're from LA, you might also argue that it's also a global South city, right? Um, that it shares some of the challenges around governance and um, sprawl and inequality that a lot of the other cities face um, throughout Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And um, also you have incredible diversity in LA that, um, one in three residents are born outside, um, in LA County are born outside the United States and a lot of them are coming and representing um, Global South cities. Um, so, but I really wanna kinda just connect this to the theme of this, um, uh, the, the conference and ask you all here in the room, I'm really excited to have this be a conversation with both all our panelists as well as like you all in the room um, and really encourage you to think about, you know, I don't have the answer to this because I always think about it too. What is the value of being able to have a conversation and learn more about um, different cities that are experiencing really different challenges and making those connections and learning from each other? And what do we get from having those, that be a really diverse set of examples and a really diverse set of cities um, and also, um, please, to you, many of you um, who are here in the audience, I'm from the US, I'm representing the work that we do internationally, but um, if you're from another city, um, please feel free. I would love to hear from you as well. Um, as we do the Q&A, you know, I'm sure you make all these observations in your daily life. Um, you know, what, what value do you get from kind of having that comparative view between these two different cities and what does that look like when it shows up in terms of um, bike culture and bike infrastructure as well. Um, so there, there's a lot of really cool work that my colleagues are doing around the world, but the one that I thought would be really fun to share with you all here today, because um, I think it's really replicable and it also um, is, has been pretty successful, some of the work that my colleagues in India have been doing under our Cycling Cities campaign um, to encourage city leaders and citizens to embrace walking and cycling. Um, so um, I'm sorry if I'm winded, I'm like six months pregnant. So it's like, <laughs> uh, um, so there is, uh, uh, yeah, so this is a, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the city leaders rather than the citizens because I think that, especially when you're thinking about kind of replicating this maybe in the U.S. or in your city, that that's a really targeted group that you can focus on. Um, and basically they asked um, leaders and citizens from all across the country to, um, for 30, for the month of January to 
see how much they could walk, cycle, or run. Um, and so they used Strava. So participants signed up um, through the link, and Strava collected all the data and also kind of created leaderboards and some competition. Um, so you know, maybe if you're in Chennai, and you can see that oh, Chennai is on the leaderboard today, and you know, you want to kind of incentivize you to to beat Pune or another city, um, and um, so my colleagues there were able to track a lot of different data and collect it and kind of create these incentives and also um, target some of the like the um, information in terms of who was sort of leading by really specific groups. So it could be like um, ministers or citizens or in specific cities or all these different categories. So the project was really successful in terms of participation. Over 22,000 people participated, and they got over 300 city leaders um, participating in, in across 75 cities in India. Um, and in a month, this is just for the city leaders, um, they had over 56,000 kilometers and over 4,000 miles hour, sorry, of walking, biking, and running. Um, and so one of the things that was really valuable of this is also that you know, city leaders can often be competitive. And this was a really great opportunity for them to really kind of channel some of that energy um, and experience the challenges that cyclists and pedestrians um, feel firsthand. And what does it really feel like to be experiencing your city like this and, and walking through these dangerous intersections and cycling through these dangerous streets? Um, and these are just some of the testimonials from city leaders um, that they really, you know, I think they shared a lot of the joy that everyone else here probably in the room feels from walking or cycling on a daily basis um, and the health benefits and um, just the energy that feels good to, you know, get on a bike and all that stuff, but also that um, it's kind of helping and supporting them to think about their roles and their jobs and the work that they do in a little bit of a different way. Um, and then we kind of wanted to start channeling that in towards uh, to long-term change. And so we've had of those participating city leaders. Um, and you know, so we had 300 different city leaders. So some of them are from similar cities. Um, so we've had about 20 sign on to do, to make commitments long-term. Um, and make those commitments around infrastructure and policy adoption, as well as campaigns and kind of cultural events as well. And I include this slide just in case you thought your team of like two people could do this. It takes a lot of people and a lot of human resources to make this happen. And I just wanted to acknowledge their amazing work and just how um, much kind of goes into this and um, in order to make it successful. Um, and then I, I want to talk a little tiny bit about our work on Los Angeles, but really leave it up to El, um, Eli to go into more detail about that. But we just put together a, a three-pager for cycling cities in Los Angeles that talks a little bit about um, some short-term political changes for 2022 that all st stakeholders in the city, from city leaders to also just regular citizens, can take in order to improve cycling infrastructure in the city. Um, you know, it's a long haul, it's a really complicated and challenging process, um, but these are some small tangible steps to move it forward and also kind of um, addressing some of the challenges and issues around um, human capacity and the need. There's a, there's a big need, I think, on the city level also for more people on the ground to be able to tackle some of the, um, the, the scope and scale of LA and to do it intentionally and thoughtfully, um, but that takes people and it takes energy. So you can download it there. I've also, there's some information in the back if you guys are interested, just pamphlets and stuff. So we'll come back to this again, but really, um, it's just, a, I love to, to be a conversation and, and to hear from all of you and just learn what you get from, you know, it's probably been a while from some of us to travel and all these things. So what do we get from making these connections and making these connections from really different cities and um, from learning from different different examples.
So with that, I would like to pass it off to Morena. Um, she's going to talk to us about her work in Bogota. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my English is not so good. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, but I'll start with a uh, video. Um, Lorena Romero. Uh, I hold a degree as a project manager and uh, as an international business professional. Uh, I'm the director of Visi Activa Foundation and currently I'm working at uh, IDEPAC, which is the Participation Institute of Bogota. Uh, my work, my, my work, uh, uh, work uh, is, uh, is the institute in uh, is being a leader of sustainable, uh, sustainable mobility. Um, quiero contarles un poco porque eh, monto bicicleta. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I ride a bicycle. Um, crecí viendo a mi familia en las carreras de ciclismo profesionales, llenar los carros con nuestras bicicletas cuando íbamos a viajar y cuando fui a la universidad fue el único medio de transporte que me permitía llegar a tiempo. Uh, I grew up with my family at professional cycling races, and we filled our cars with uh, bicycles whenever we went out uh, to travel. And I went to uh, college, uh, and that was the only mode of transportation that would really let me get to where I was going on time. Tuve por varios años problemas cardíacos y una operación que me hizo abandonar los entrenamientos de patinaje. Uh, I had heart problems for years and surgery that made me uh, let go of my skating training. Y desde que empecé a usar la bicicleta, hasta se convirtió no solo en mi medicina, sino también en el medio de, eh, que me permitía conocer gente, viajar, conocer realmente mi ciudad. Y quería eh, que todos, en especial las mujeres, pues usaran la bicicleta. Um, since I started riding a bicycle, uh, it, it became not only a medicine for me, but also a way of meeting people, of traveling, uh, really getting to know my city and um, getting uh, to know uh, everybody, especially, uh, and, and I wanted everybody, especially women, to, to start to ride bicycles as well. 
En Bogotá y en general en Colombia, al igual que yo, muchos tuvimos una experiencia muy cercana a la bicicleta toda la vida. Uh, in, in Bogotá, but in Colombia in general, um, just like me, uh, many, uh, many Colombians had uh, a very uh, intimate experience uh, with bicycles our entire life. Crecimos sabiendo que nuestros ciclistas son los mejores del mundo, viendo a nuestros abuelos, padres, familia, amigos, usar la bicicleta para ir a ciclovía, hacer mercado, llevar a los niños al colegio, a trabajar a la universidad, a cine, los campesinos llevando sus cosechas. Pedimos domicilios que llevan en bicicleta en todo lugar y en todo momento tenemos una bicicleta que cuenta la historia con nosotros. Uh, we grew up uh, knowing that our cyclists were the best in the world. But also watching our grandparents, our, our parents, our families, our friends, all riding bicycles, uh, going out on the ciclovías, going, to, going shopping, uh, taking the kids to school, going to work, to, to university, out to the movies, um, you know, uh, people in, uh, in rural areas uh, bringing their harvest to market um, whenever we order food, Uh, to, to be delivered at home, it's always on a bicycle. Um, and for every memorable moment in our lives, there's, there's always a bicycle there to help tell the story. En Colombia existe un importante y un gran eh, movimiento de base en torno a la bicicleta. Uh, in Colombia, there's a large uh, grassroots movement uh, for bicycling. Eh, Bogotá cuenta con una presencia importante de activistas que viene desde mucho tiempo atrás. En uh, Bogotá en particular, there's a large activist movement um, that has been growing since uh, quite a long time. Desde los años 70, Bogotá, eh, que es, es una ciudad desarrollada en torno y en función al automóvil, ha tenido hitos muy interesantes en torno a la promoción y el uso de la bicicleta. Since the 70s, uh, Bogotá, which is a city that was developed around cars, uh, has had some very uh, uh, interesting achievements and milestones around uh, promoting and using bicycles. Las dos ruedas hacen parte de nuestra cultura, tanto deportiva como recreativa y de movilidad. Este importante biciactivismo, del que biciactivo hace parte, ha logrado articularse con el gobierno de la ciudad. Uh, Uh, Two-wheel transportation has uh, become a, a part of our culture, uh, not only um, as a sport, uh, as recreation, and as transportation. And our bicycle uh, activism uh, for us at BC Activa uh, has helped uh, e express uh, what the government needs to do for our city. Iniciativas ciudadanas se han convertido en políticas públicas y han permanecido en el tiempo. Tenemos una serie de hitos importantes, pero en este momento quiero centrarme en dos. Uh, community initiatives become public policy and take root. And uh, we have had um, quite a few achievements, uh, but uh, for this, uh, uh, at the moment, I'd like to focus on two of them. La ciclovía tiene actualmente 48 años, 128 kilómetros o 79 millas. Eh, en la capital de mi país, desde hace casi cinco décadas, las principales vías de la ciudad se peatonalizan y se convierten en un gran espacio para las bicicletas. Vías de tres y cuatro carriles, libres de tráfico automot automotor, se convierten en un gran espacio de recreación, convivencia, aprendizaje y movilidad. La ciclovía... Um, which started 48 years ago and uh, has 128 kilometers or 79 miles uh, in the network uh, in the, the capital of my country uh, started five decades ago. The, the main uh, arteries of the city are closed off to cars and become uh, a huge space for bicycles. Three and four lane Uh, roads are, are free of uh, motor vehicles and become a space for recreation, community, learning, and mobility. Imaginen por un momento Columbus Avenue, eh, en San Francisco, libre de cualquier tipo de motor y lleno de personas en bicicleta, patines, trotando, eh, paseando con su familia y con sus amigos. 
Just imagine for a moment Columbus Avenue right here in San Francisco, free of motor vehicles and full of people on bicycles, skating, jogging, or just out walking with their family or friends. De manera sistemática, casi todos los domingos y festivos del año se liberan en Bogotá las principales calles de automotores y esta dinámica hace ahora parte del patrimonio de los bogotanos. Por otra parte, en, eh, Bogotá tiene una importante red de ciclorrutas con más de 560 kilómetros o 348 millas de extensión. So every Sunday uh, throughout the year, uh, throughout the city of Bogota, the, the, the main streets are closed off to automobiles. And this dynamic has become a part of the heritage of the local people. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, Bogota also has uh, a large uh, network of bicycle lanes, more than 560 kilometers or 300, 348 miles. Pero así como hay iniciativas eh, de los grupos de activistas de la ciudad, hay espacios de participación consagrados en la ley y en la administración distrital. Los consejos de, eh, locales y distrital de la bicicleta, eh, programas como el colegio en bici, al trabajo en bici, escuela de la bici, rutas seguras que acompañan a los ciclistas en los picos de montaña eh, con ejército y policía nacional, entre otros que no nacieron de las administraciones, eh, no nacieron de ningún alcalde, nacieron de los ciclistas, por, que por décadas han pedido eh, por su dinámica cultural más y mejores programas para usar medios alternativos de transporte y para solventar la falta de metro, eh, de un buen sistema de transporte público, de infraestructura vial que reduzca los, los tiempos de tránsito. Uh, but as there are uh, initiatives um, from the bicycle activists in the city, um, the, they've also been uh, codified in law and in district administration. Um, there are local and district bicycle boards, uh, programs for going to school on bicycles, uh, for bike to work, um, bike to university, safe routes, for cyclists um, to get over hills, um, um, to share the roads with national police and military, uh, among others. Uh, and none of these programs were born out of the government itself from the mayors or other government administrations. They were born out of the cyclists themselves. For decades, um, they've been asking Uh, demanding uh, a better cultural dynamic, better programs uh, for modes of transportation and to figure out how to get where they need to go, better infrastructure uh, to reduce transit time. En Colombia hemos demostrado que el biciactivismo se puede convertir en política pública y que la política pública se puede convertir en biciactivismo. En Colombia, we have demonstrated that bicycle activism can be turned into public policy, and public policy can become bicycle activism. Claro, el interés político, la creación de políticas públicas, el seguimiento de entidades de control eh, y corporaciones como el Consejo de Bogotá facilitan que la ciudad cada día sea que en la ciudad cada día sean más y más los ciclistas, pero real, realmente es una apuesta ciudadana la que hemos puesto como referente de la bicicleta eh, de Latinoamérica. Uh, of course, um, political interests and uh, creating uh, public policy, uh, following uh, administrative controls, uh, corporations uh, and other entities, for example, the, the Council of Bogota, um, these all help the city to become more and more bike friendly. But uh, above all, It's an initiative of the people of Bogota um, that has made bicycling a, a priority. Yo me sumé al 5% de viajes hace años, que hace años se tomaba la ciudad a pedalazos. Hoy ya somos aproximadamente 8%, todavía las mujeres seguimos siendo minoría, siendo el 24.2% cuando los hombres son el 75.8%, así como eh, fui parte y apoyé de la creación 
apoyé en la creación del segundo consejo local de la bicicleta de la ciudad. Uh, I've joined the 5% of, of trips um, that for years have been taken in the city uh, uh, pedaling and uh, now it's approximately 8% of all trips. Um, women are still a minority, 24.2%, uh, uh, while men are 75.8% uh, of these trips in bicycle. Um, uh, I also took part and supported the creation of the local bicycle, uh, the second uh, life bicycle board in the city. Eh, hace años éramos solo 10 personas en dos consejos locales de la bicicleta en Bogotá. Estos espacios que proponen, asesoran, articulan y desde lo local hasta lo distrital, eh, pues generan todos los temas de política pública y actividades en torno a la movilidad sostenible. Ahora son 18 los consejos que tiene la ciudad y 80 personas alrededor que lo conforman. 60 years ago, um, there were just two uh, local bicycle boards in Bogotá. Um, which was uh, a space to evaluate and express um, uh, public policy and bicycle-related uh, sustainable transportation, uh, both on a district and local level. Uh, now there are 18 bicycle boards throughout the city um, that uh, are formed by around 80 people. Antes la ciudad tenía alrededor de 20 organizaciones sociales que trabajábamos para incentivar el uso de la bicicleta y ahora son alrededor de 130 que están caracterizadas. Uh, the city had about 20 non-profit organizations um, that worked to incentivize bicycling and there are now about 130. Hoy seguimos siendo el único medio de comunicación comunitario hecho por ciclistas eh, de la ciudad y queremos seguir contando estas historias que hacen de Bogotá, pues que Bogotá sea una de las capitales mundiales de la bicicleta. Pero we are still the only community-based um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, radio station. Okay. We're the only uh, community radio station. Uh, in the city, um, by and for cycling, cycling, cyclists, and uh, we want to keep uh, telling these stories uh, that make Bogota the bicycle capital of the world. One of the bicycle capitals of the world. Sorry. Uh, bicycling is a big part uh, of the future. That is why Indiciactiva considers that bike, uh, bikes uh, are an essential tool uh, for our emancipation. Uh, when we're biking, we know we create culture and happiness. Thank you so much. Testing, testing.
Looks like we're looking for one of our panelists. Um, I'm supposed to go last, because LA, first of all, how many people in the house are from LA? I just want to see. <laughs> Represent, okay, cool, there's a good, good number of people. Um, the joke of this, and I'm sort of vamping as we find our next panelist, is that like LA is not really known for cycling culture or infrastructure, um, but we're, we're coming, and we just, uh, we're inspired by all these other organizations from across the globe. We are the only uh, member of the Cycling Cities ITDP's uh, pro program to encourage uh, 25 million people to get closer to 25 miles worth of uh, uh, bicycle infrastructure in their space. Um, and we see ourselves as Latin America North, um, and, uh, and we are truly a, a diverse and emerging culture um, of cyclists. Uh, but I don't know if I should be going now, or it's like they're still figuring it out. Um, should I go? Or I'm on. Okay, cool. <laughs> Let's get into it. Thanks. Um, and and if, the, if our other panelist comes, uh, that would be great. So, okay, so hello. My name is Eli Kira Kaufman. Uh, I am the executive director of the LA County Bicycle Coalition. We've been around for about 20 years advocating for safer, healthier, more equitable streets for everyone in LA, which seems like a non sequitur or an oxymoron, kind of like military intelligence. Uh, for Angelinos, but, um, but we, we are, all kidding aside, people who really believe that the bicycle is a vehicle for progress that's going to transform our region into a, uh, a more livable place and uh, a place that is uh, more inclusive of all kinds of folks. Um, so if you could go to the next, oh, I got to do my own slide, sorry. Um, LA should be a world-class cycling city. Uh, I love that title that, uh, that was in the last presentation, uh, the bicycle capital of the world. We could not claim that in our current state. <laughs> but the fact is we should be a Mecca, or we should be a, a bicycling hub at least, because we enjoy this beautiful uh, temperate climate year round that's uh, b basically Mediterranean. The vast majority of people in LA live in what we call the flats, where there's very little elevation gain, which means they don't have to climb hills uh, to get from point A to B. And so uh, for those two reasons alone, LA should be a much more bike-friendly place than it is. Uh, another reason why we should be a, a world-class cycling city uh, is that e-bikes are becoming more uh, attainable, uh, the price point's coming down, and for people who need to shrink the sprawl and get from point A to B, again, the e-bike, uh, in a way, is, a, is an opportunity to, to help more folks get on bicycles uh, more often. And uh, actually, LA has invested pretty heavily in uh, infrastructure over the past uh, couple decades. There's all kinds of new metro, public transit's coming in, um, and, uh, but it really still sucks to walk and bike around LA, uh, even though uh, metro and transit is coming online. Uh, but for those three reasons alone, LA should be a much more friendly place to, to be on a bike and be on foot. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm the next slide. So easy. Um, all right, so this is just like a quick, uh, these numbers seem bad for uh, the Bay Area because it's a small place and, 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 and they're bad for LA as well, but it just gives you a sense as to uh, how much uh, fatalities and, and, and catastrophic uh, casualties are still happening in LA and it's increasing year to year. It's a huge problem uh, for drivers, for pedestrians and cyclists uh, alike. You can see the numbers, even in spite of the pandemic when there was less traffic on our streets, uh, people were driving faster. And so the collisions that were happening in LA were catastrophic. So people weren't uh, walking away or limping away. They were getting just wiped out. And, and, and so we saw an uptick in those types of catastrophic events in Los Angeles. Um, and this is something that People for Bikes has talked about for a few years, but uh, we really believe in this, that we will not have peace on our streets or more livable communities until everyone in Los Angeles has an equitable piece of the street. Um, we're not into sharrows. If you were in my last presentation, sharrows are weak. We know that they don't really protect lives. We need to have more infrastructure that's more built, that's more permanent, that's more lasting, that's more sustainable. Um, for those folks who can be vehicular riders, go, go with the wind. We love you as well, but we want to make sure that our mothers, our children, our differently abled folks are also able to get uh, on the lane and be protected by real infrastructure. Um, our aim at LACBC is to improve the quality of life for everyone in LA uh, by advocating for this safe, equitable, and joyous region to bicycle. I like to say that because we're not really talking about just bicyclists. We're talking about drivers, we're talking about pedestrians, we're talking about transit users. 
In LA, the, 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 the scenario is we live in a car town. We have the Peterson Car Museum, for Christ's sakes, which is like this museum that's devoted to the car as this vehicle of progress. Um, there's a love affair. The fast food, uh, food drive through was invented in LA. Um, so we're, we're, we're cognizant that we live in a certain context in Los Angeles, which is very car-centric. Uh, that said, uh, we also recognize that the car is not the long-term solution, whether it's gas-powered or electric, and that in order for us to actually move the needle to a more equitable and safer place for everyone is that we're going to have to start getting more people on foot and on bike in that beautiful Mediterranean climate again, where most people can get to A to B on a relatively flat surface with, uh, without a lot, a lot of elevation gain. So what are the roadblocks in LA? Um, NIMBY activism, both extremes of the gentrification argument. In LA, we deal with both extremes. So, uh, so for the people in the more affluent communities, we get this sort of pushback that uh, bike lanes bring in the riffraff, the undesirables, people on bicycles are, you know, sweaty or whatever their problem is, <laughs> right? All kidding aside, we hear this. We hear this in neighborhood council meetings. We hear this sort of feedback. And it's uh, disheartening uh, because it's so, um, it's so short-sighted and it doesn't really think about the larger picture uh, of uh, public health and public wellness and public connectivity. Uh, to the other extreme of the argument, which is that uh, bicycle infrastructure gentrifies and that gentrification displaces people. And so at LACBC, and I think this is probably the case in the Bay Area and across the, the, the state and the, and the country, we have to have these conversations on both ends of the spectrum. The ch challenge in LA is that on either end of that spectrum, the, uh, the, the, the NIMBY voices, that, that minority, those minority voices are loud and they are um, entitled in, in, in certain ways. And so that's been a big challenge for us in, in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a lack of funding. Uh, most of the funding that we uh, attract for infrastructure and culture for bicycling in LA is in the form of grants and it takes years to secure that money. Uh, then those monies have all these deliverables. Those deliverables uh, are onerous. Reporting is onerous. And, and, and the money flows slowly and sort of uh, ineffectively. So for anyone who's a fundraiser in the house, uh, you know, there's got to be a better way of funding our projects to make sure that they're more sustainable and lasting. Uh, but that's an issue that we definitely uh, have to deal with in LA as well. Uninspired design concepts, you know, just writing on Telegraph and in different, different places throughout the Bay Area. There's just, there's a, there's, a, there's a better experience here. I'm just gonna say it. Um, and a lot of our people don't have that lived experience of being on a truly protected bike lane, feeling like they're being supported by the infrastructure in Los Angeles. So they, what you don't experience in your lived experience, you can't advocate for as easily, right? You can't, you can't sort of like go home to your mom and say, this is something that changed my life and my ability to get around my community. Uh, because you're sort of, at least in my case, and in, in Los Angeles, we have to sort of, well, you know, have you been to, have you been to Oakland? Have you been to Portland? Have you been to uh, Bogota? Have you been to these places? Um, by the way, seeing all those cow bike people in, in, in Bogota, that's pretty, it's pretty excellent. What a great trip you guys got a chance to do. Um, but there's a bigger systemic issue in LA, okay? And that is that the Mobility Plan 2035 that was uh, voted on by our uh, council members uh, back in 2015, very little of it has actually been uh, implemented, 3% of it actually. So that's seven years, 3%, that's a little bit more than 90 miles of over 3,000 miles of infrastructure that was meant to support cyclists, pedestrians, buses, and actually cars. Um, so we have this sort of gridlock in our political system that doesn't allow things to move forward. And what's really important to understand about LA is that it's so sprawling and big is that there's 15 council districts. Each one of those council districts is a fiefdom onto itself with 200 to 300,000 residents, sizes of small, mid-sized cities in most of America. And each one of those council districts has the power to veto any major systemic change in terms of infrastructure. So imagine getting 15 different kings and queens to sit around a round table and actually agree on anything. It's like, hard, impossible, these words don't even like get close to how difficult it is. It's, 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 uh, it's maddening. It's maddening is probably what it is. Also our DOT, uh, even though there's, uh, and Salida Reynolds came from up here actually originally, uh, coming down to LA had big ideas for LA, but when she, when she went into that uh, political machine, the LA DOT also lacks the power to really implement any of its own plans as well uh, without the express 
consent and support of those council uh, of those council members. So that's that's a really tough that's a really tough uh, barrier. Oh, I already talked about this. The Mobility Plan 2035. Look at this beautiful uh, array of different sort of bike lanes. It almost transforms LA. Those are not freeways. It looks like freeways, but those are not freeways. Those are, that is active transportation infrastructure that was meant to be done uh, by 2035. At this rate, it'll be 2235 before we see any of that happening. Uh, LA continues to ignore its own plan um, uh, because the mayor and DOT have to win the support of each of those council members, as I mentioned. But we are working, and I think it's such an inspiration point to look at what's happening in Bogota that uh, one of the sound bites that I, I really resonated with was this idea that none of these big ideas that are happening there came from the government. They came from you all. They came from us, people on the street, people who are parents, people who are uh, who need to who, who understand the the benefits and the and the power of being on a bicycle, and so. If you can do it there, we feel like we can maybe do it in LA. And so here's some of the things that are happening. Um, we're with a bunch of folks uh, doing a, first of all, we got to get the right people in power, right? We can do all this advocacy. We can build bikes. We can sort of do programming, bicycle education in LAUSD. We can get amazing board members to donate time and resources and treasure to help support the fight. But if we have the wrong people, and I mean that, in office, all of that is basically for naught. And so we're looking at a way of creating a, a platform, a, a voter education program for the mayoral race, which is coming up. We have partners here with uh, Climate Resolve, Move LA, Sick La Via, LA Walks. Jonathan, John Yee's here today, he's presenting upstairs. Definitely say hi to him. He's part of the multimodal action transportation movement that's growing in LA. Uh, but the idea is to create a questionnaire that actually puts the, ele the, uh, the candidates on the spot to reveal their true ideas about how to uh, how to implement not only the plan, but how to how to future forward our, our transportation system in LA. The questionnaire will be focused on uh, with 10 different groups that are supporting, and we're also building a, uh, we're gonna do a candidate forum with LA Taco, which is a really cool magazine that uh, spreads the word around everything that matters in LA, uh, that will we'll get hopefully all these mayoral candidates uh, to, to fill out the questionnaire and, and show up for the forum. Now here's the challenge. If you go in LA to any of the mayor candidates uh, websites, one thing you're not going to see is much about active transportation, about bicycling, about pedestrianism. That's the one thing you're not going to see a lot about. Not that there are not other important issues in LA, right? Like, uh, like the underhoused and the fact that there's a lack of access to dignified work and good health care and education. But it's really the third rail topic in Los Angeles the, that just requires so much political courage uh, that the vast majority of candidates, and certainly once they're elected officials, they stay the hell away from it, uh, which is why a place like LFTBC and our partners have to make sure that they stay honest, they return to the hard questions around how connectivity and mobility are essential to creating a just and equitable community, right? Um, it's just something they don't want to touch, but we're, we're going to make them look at it. The other thing that we're doing, and I mentioned this at the top, is we're trying to find unusual partners. So we, uh, we applied for a grant uh, with the LADWP uh, community, um, community Emissions Diversion Program that is essentially a, a half a million dollar pro project to mode shift small delivery, uh, small uh, locally owned businesses to move away from daily driver cars to e-bikes. These are these fat tire Hemway bikes, they're kind of like the Rad Power, but like the less fancy ones. Um, but essentially, it's, a, uh, it's, like a, it's like a bike truck. Uh, we're working with some partners here in the room, Jimmy Lazama over here and his team, to retrofit those bikes so that they can become uh, carriers of all kinds of different types of uh, business, wh whether it's like um, a service or like a, a florist or a, uh, a baker or whatever. But we're, we're trying to retrofit these bikes with like, racking systems so that they can actually deliver, they can, people can get out of their cars and start delivering and, and, and moving via bicycle. Um, we're really excited about the program. We've got 11 got 11 courageous businesses in CD15, which is one of the 15 council districts I was mentioning before. Um, and we're just starting the process of signing these businesses up. And here's how it works, because I want to share a little bit about this. The number one reason why we hear in LA why people don't want to get on e-bikes is because they cost too much. And they do, and they did. Certainly, they cost a lot more than uh, the average Angelino can approach. But, but this program basically highly subsidizes it so that for the first six months, these small businesses don't have to pay a dime. They can just have the, like a library. They rent these bikes. They have six months to just basically use them, 
figure out how to incorporate them into the mechanisms of their business. And then at the end of that six month period, they have the choice to either purchase the bikes at a deep discount or return them, no, no questions asked. And then we recycle it back into the program. So there's, we're lowering the barrier to entry so that no one can say, well, I can't afford that. Why, how am I gonna like get, you know, change? It's, it's already too much of a head thing for me to get on a bike and ride my stuff around. Now you're gonna ask me to pay for it? So we're saying, okay, we're fine. We'll take the money completely out of the picture and then see how it goes. Um, and so we're really, we're bullish on this. We hope that this is gonna uh, create a mode shift that, that's gonna start in CD15 and grow throughout the rest of the council districts. And we had a program that's happening right now that's talking about it. Kevin Shin is discussing that. So unfortunately, if you uh, come talk to me if you wanna learn more about this e-bike uh, program with LEDWP. Um, and then if you were up with us earlier, and I, I'm sorry, how am I doing on time? Do I need to go faster? I gotta go faster, okay, a little faster. Um, Sunset for All is a project that we talked about in the two success stories, uh, one that's telegraphed here in your local hometown. By the way, my mom would be pissed. Um, thank you to Bike East Bay, thank you for CalBike for hosting uh, this event, for gathering us, convening us. It's been such a long time since I've been with most of you, and I just, um, I want to just pause and just acknowledge that how, how grateful I am that we are able to be together and, and actually talk about this stuff that we care. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and in that spirit, uh, Sunset for All is a similar kind of a project, completely community-led, all-volunteer group of people decided this 3.2-mile gap in the mountainous part of Sunset between Douglas and basically, uh, which is near Dodger Stadium, and basically uh, Vermont, uh, where there's no ancillary sort of like calm side streets, that, that we need to actually create a bi-directional protected bike lane in this, in this area. There has been over a thousand deaths on this stretch of road over the past 10 years. It's, a, it's, on, it's on the high injury network, it's in Vision Zero, it's, it's on the Mobility Plan 2035 I mentioned earlier. And yet, what we have there are Sharrows currently. So we gathered uh, community members through our Neighborhood Bicycle Ambassador Program three years ago, and we started to talk about what it would take to transform this car thoroughfare into a destination or a new main street for Angelinos. Um, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a community-led vision. This is actually artwork that was done by an artist who's local to, to the corridor. Uh, it's going to create bike lanes, improved crosswalks, pocket parks, all kinds of amenities for every type of modality, so that no matter whether you're on foot, on bike, using transit or in a car, you can get to where you need to go safely and with ease. That's the idea behind it. And we're pitching it not as a bike lane, right? Because we get it thrown in our face when we start talking about bike infrastructure. We're creating this as a cultural trail, somewhat like what Indianapolis did with their cultural trail. We're talking about this as, as reimagining Sunset as a destination um, that happens to have a bike lane because that's how you get to the destination. Um, here's a quick map to show the connectivity. Uh, that will basically essentially lead to Dodger Stadium from, uh, from Vermont, that little spur that drops down from B to A. That's actually Santa Monica Boulevard. If you've been to LA, you'll recognize this. This way we connect Sunset for All to uh, uh, the Vermont uh, uh, Metro Station, thereby connecting over 100,000 local residents to, to public transit, to Metro. Um, so connectivity is a big part of it. Again, it fulfills the LA Mobility tr uh, Plan transportation. Uh, um, and you can't see it, but that's, that's part of their, the plan. It's a zero high injury network, 6% of streets with 65% of severe pedestrian and injury deaths. That's part of this, this whole corridor. Um, the way we did this is we actually did a crowdfunding campaign. So again, totally volunteers with the support of LACBC. We serve as their fiscal sponsor. But the basic idea is that we said, you know, this, this, this person who's outside, right outside the window right there, Avital, was hit by a car on Sunset, decided I'm sick and tired of putting my life at risk when I get on my bicycle to commute to work. She actually works at Metro. Um, and uh, we're gonna organize this and we're gonna not wait for DOT or the council members to sort of understand what needs to happen. We're gonna start crowdfunding and let people vote with their pocketbooks to help us do the initial engineering, totally radical. Like we don't have any control over the right of way. We're not an engineering firm. We don't know how to like put in a bike lane. We don't have any rights to that, except for that we are residents and we live there. And so the idea is that to do this crowdfunding campaign, we, we raised over $30,000 in a little less than six weeks. We were able to go to a semi-retired gentleman, Rock Miller, who's wandering around here today as well, who is a street engineer to do the initial engineering plans. In LA, when we talk to council members, just a little aside, they'll say to us, 
well, we need to do a lot of public engagement in order for you to, so we know that the will of the people is behind this project. But we can't really do the public engagement until we have at least initial engineering plans for people to respond to. So it's a perfect vicious cycle that says, if you don't have the public engagement, then you can't have the money to do the engineering. But if you don't have the engineering, what kind of public engagement can you really do to show people what's possible? So we were like, we're gonna break that system. We're gonna fundraise our own money. We're gonna hire our own engineers. And we're gonna do it nicely. We're not trying to do their job. I'm actually a nicer guy than I sound today. And, and we're, we're gonna bring this thing on a platter, a, a silver platter, uh, to, 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 uh, to the council member and say, we've got the vote of the people. They paid with their pocketbooks to sort of uh, support this. Uh, so we have done the public engagement. Here's the initial engineering that just gives something for us to respond to. Let's start doing more like uh, in-depth public engagement. You got the political cover. You haven't spent a dime to get this thing started. So like, what's the reason why we can't like get this going? Like what's stopping us now? And that's the theory that we're trying to work with with Sunset for All. This is a quick example of, of, of some of the work that Rock Miller and the uh, GTS Engineering has done in the past. The Third Street Long Beach, I just found out this morning, was the first protected bike lane uh, in Southern California that, that had the, the car parking in that, in that, in, uh, along the Third Street in Long Beach. Um, but he's, he's, this is just to say that Rock is a world-class engineer. Um, our public engagement, part of what we learned during the pandemic I should slow down, sorry. Part of what we learned in the pandemic is that, um, is that businesses are afraid of infrastructure. They're afraid of change. And in LA, especially what they think it, business equates is parking spaces. And so we wanted to prove, before we asked these businesses to sign on to our work, we wanted to prove that bikes do mean business. And so every time, uh, for, for a number of Saturdays and Thursdays, we start to say, hey, bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, go frequent this location. Wear your helmet in the store, in your walking shoes. Talk about how you got there and why the way you got there mattered as much as the fact that you did get there. And spend your money and make sure they know that you're a cyclist or a pedestrian. And so that started, that started a whole movement to, 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 to socialize and get people to, to support um, Sunset for All along the corridor. Uh, because they thought, oh, hey, you know, maybe bikes and people on foot do mean business. We created a business brochure, uh, which we're very proud of. Um, and I have copies of these tomorrow, so if you really want them, they're beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hand them out to you. But they're basically uh, the business case for creating uh, this corridor uh, of the, along these 3.2 miles. Um, it shows uh, a little bit of the infrastructure that people can imagine what it might look like. And the print is too small, but mostly I'm just showing this because it's, it's, it's pretty and I, we're proud of it. Um, a final, final couple things. So this is the last, that's Cynthia Rose. Um, I gotta go. So this is Cynthia Rose. We, we basically, LACBC's view of this is we wanna create a playbook that is replicable, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna take all the lessons learned from Sunset for All and these amazing advocates who've crowdfunded and not taking no for an answer and develop a basic playbook of ingredients and an order to things so that other neighborhood leaders can develop, and democratize the design, implementation, and stewardship of their local neighborhood streets. And so the idea is how do we replicate this? And that's what we're working on right now. Um, by showing up at places like these. Uh, we also have these flappies I want to just point out. These are going on the, the windows of businesses along Sunset for All uh, so that people can use that QR code and learn more about what the transformation might look like. Uh, these are like the Zagats, you know, how they, they talk about this is a Zagat Reagan re uh, restaurant. Well, this is a, this is a public, like, uh, uh, a multimodal active transportation flappy like Zagats. So there, it's a way for people to show their support. Uh, again, we're not going to have peace on the streets or more livable communities in Los Angeles until everyone has an equitable piece of the street, of every modality. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about our work, you can, you can go there or you can just replace info with Eli at la-bike.org. I'm here to learn from you. I'm here to share ideas with you. If you have an, other infrastructure projects in your area that you wanna like telegraph that you want uh, us to learn about, like let's share information. Let's do some peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and also we have some ideas about the major funding that's coming from the feds and also from ATP grants that are coming up in June. So come talk to us about those, 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 those monies. Um, the point is we need as many of those dollars to go towards active transportation, whether it's Sunset for All or LACBC or Bike East Bay or Cal Bike, we need to get those dollars. We all win when one of us wins. Thank you.
Okay, uh, hello everybody. I'm hoping that you can hear me. Uh, I'm gonna breeze through these slides pretty quickly because I know we're running late across all fronts. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, our work as a Finnish cycling assembly here in Finland. I was hoping to be there with you, but family emergency required me to stay here in the city in Helsinki. Um, Helsinki has a vision and the vision is to be the most functional city in the world and to be carbon neutral by 2035. Now, what does the most functional city mean? Really, it means in terms of transportation that cycling, walking, transit, and even cars all have their place in the ecosystem and they know where that place is. Um, they're looking to get as part of the carbon neutral effort by 2035 to uh, achieve a 20% cycling mode share by that time. They have plus or minus about 10% today. And um, interestingly enough, and I think it's worth celebrating that of that 10% mode share, women comprise 61% and men 39% of cyclists in Helsinki. Just a few examples of the kinds of things that they're trying to do across the street on the left slide, you can see a big delivery van and they're trying to reduce the number of those that come into the city each day. And so DHL uh, and Schenker from Germany are all now trying to do from parking their trucks on the perimeter of the city and then coming into the center using um, various more modes of, of cargo bikes. Uh, outside of Helsinki, there's a small town, well, smallish city uh, in the north called Oulu. And we like to call the things that they're doing uh, Oulu Snow How. Uh, and they've really become the world's winter cycling capital. Uh, in the summertime, they have a 28% mode share in their city. And in winter, it goes down to 12% only. Um, and there's a famous school now that's, that's there, there's been videos all over the internet and photographs all over Pinterest, um, a, a school called Metsukongas, where 1,200 students attend school. And of the 1,200, uh, 1,000 of them are riding their bicycles every single day. Uh, th they're embarking on a new kind of, or at least new for Finland, a kind of bike lane that is, that is you know, grade separated, often space separated if they can. Um, you know, Eli was talking about Sharos and he um, demonstrated a, a bit of a disdain for that as I, as I can understand. And that made me think of my friend, Morton Cable, who used to say about painted Sharos and even painted lanes on, on streets, that paint was the lazy politician's way of saying, we don't care. Um, and in Helsinki, they've really taken that to heart. Uh, the cost of building these, depending on where you are in Finland, has run anywhere from 650,000 euros per kilometer to up to 4 million in tighter uh, places like Helsinki. And the right is a page out of the bicycle account uh, manual that they, pr that they uh, produce every couple of years. And there was an article in this bike account about um, the, the fact that through the construction of the kind of bike lane that you see on the left here, um, they get an eight euro return on every euro spent. Um, and, that's, and that becomes a great story to tell to elected officials at the city and at the national level as well. And so that breaks down just briefly that um, 393 of the million euro benefit come from health benefits and, and reduced health costs. And of course, the state health infrastructure is, is public and single payer. And so they really do become a, a, benefic a benefactor. Um, Time saved, because that's actually the quickest way to get around town, uh, comes down to 171 million euros a year, and environmental benefits are, are pegged at 6 million. Cost of crashes and cost of maintenance of the, these banas or these um, bike paths themselves um, cuts into the, the return a little bit, but they're still getting uh, almost 8 uh, euros return on every euro invested. Uh, I spend my time between Minneapolis and between Helsinki, and so I always put this slide up because on the left, if you just go to Google and you and you um, you know select the bike lanes <clears throat> on both of these cities, you can see just how much more density there is of bike infrastructure in Helsinki. The center of Helsinki is pretty much where it says Helsinki down at the bottom of the of the page there. Um, but and and to be fair, as you get further away from the city, many of these um, bike lanes are shared with pedestrians, but they're wide enough for both. The mode share that has now, you know, at, at right around 10%, uh, actually has dropped down to nine, um, or they anticipated dropping down to nine, in part because the, the influx of people moving into Helsinki, and so they haven't kind of adapted 
the, the, the way of life that is a much more urban, cycling friendly, cycling urbanist way of life. But you can see that the mode share tracks right up against the millions of euros uh, realized investment. Uh, and it's interesting to note that back in 1940, Helsinki had a 30% mode share. Uh, there's a great vibrant bike share system in Helsinki that has, I think, a model, uh, financial model for the world. 10% uh, of the revenue from, um, from the use comes from daily users, and that's about 2 million euros a year. And then 61,000 members um, at 35 euros a year provide um, the rest of almost 2 million euros into the city. The city pays 2 million to an operator, and then the operator can sponsor the system from any source that they want. Uh, and, we, and the dollars that are top secret, we're, we don't know any of those. Uh, the slide here I wanted to show is that this is this is a matrix that is in the um, every five year uh, bike plan that the city creates as a comprehensive bike plan. And this really demonstrates, I, I don't have time to go into all of the elements on here, but this really de de demonstrates that they're looking for so many um, ways to kind of di dissect and, and intersect the, the various parts and pieces in the city that make a city bike friendly. Uh, and the last slide here is um, part, part of our, the core of our work is these three-day Helsinki study travel courses. Um, we would invite you, anybody is, who is left in the audience after the wait, uh, to come and see us in May, August, or October of each year, uh, and we'll put on a, a, great, um, a great meeting and a, and a, a, a great learning exercise. Um, we had a delegation from Hungary um, about a month and a half ago. And it was really interesting. They, they really kind of brought to light what we have been believing. And that is that if, if you want to be truly inspired about cycling cities, go to Amsterdam and go to, to uh, Copenhagen. But come to Helsinki if you want to learn how fairly quickly you can get your city to 10%, which seems to be a, a kind of barrier to overcome. And that once, once that 10% wall is kind of broken, um, it becomes easier to make it grow still further. Uh, for the last photograph on the right, I wanted to take you to uh, Oulu again. Um, since their uh, infrastructure is covered with snow you know, for a good half of the year, uh, they've devised a, a way of projecting these images onto the snow from the tops of streetlights. And it's brilliant. Um, wherever you go in the city, you can see um, the ways that they've delineated these paths. Uh, it, my email is on the bottom of the sheet here. If you're interested in coming to Helsinki to give us a visit, we would love to have you um, and get in touch. And that's my remarks. Thank you very much.